That looks like a good light. Perfect. All right. So let's see if we have the recording or not. But at least everybody here, you made you made it here, so you uh, watch it. That's perfect. Okay. So yes, hi from my side, and I'm uh, very happy to be here. It's actually my first CNCS um, meetup, and it is my estate first time in Prague. But the last time was 2017, so a long, long time ago. And uh, yes, to, uh, today I want to talk a little bit about production grades uh, Postgres on Kubernetes with Stackless. I hope you can read this. So you will see I'm not good at slides, so I will mostly do live uh, demos, which is more fun for you because everything can go wrong and can, you know, we can laugh about it. And um, especially I will talk about production rates uh, Postgres because, um, yeah, as we will see, running databases in Kubernetes is, uh, is interesting. Okay, so um, about myself, my name is Sebastian, originally from uh, Germany. I am self-employed, and I mostly, as you can see with these titles, am in the enterprise Java space. So I have some Java titles there. I usually do some sort of enterprise Java, but also in general, um, enterprise software and anything that enterprises need. You know, so it's just, um, a lot of uh, cloud-native technologies, automation, testing, DevOps, things like that, but also Java. Okay, but today it's about databases, and this, uh, um, this is actually me, did I? You hear something in the back? Okay, anyway, I thought I'm making two noises. Um, especially in this uh, space of running stateless applications, it is, is it me that I do something with the microphone? Speakers. No. Sure. Yeah, everything is muted. It works not that. I don't know. Not me moving, um, because especially having something stateless is very easy, but having some state or some persistence that's hard. So you know, code is easy, state is hard. That basically means it's easy to have some sort of stateless application and just deploy it. You know, like a lambda, and you're done. Yes, but with some state that's a little bit harder. So in Kubernetes speak, that means stateless is easy, but databases or persistence or stateful applications are hard. Okay, so then what to do with it? And there are, well, different um, solutions out there. The easiest one is to say, okay, I don't care. I just do my deployment for a Postgres database and see what happens. So, yeah, for testing, that's, that's okay. Maybe not so well. I can use... Um, Stateful uh, sets, stateful sets, for example, I can try to go with persistent volumes. Or actually, the other thing would be to have a real operator, and that's kind of an easy, uh, easy and interesting thing. Because even now, this community, um, data on Kubernetes community, as part of the scenes, it's it feels like I'm doing some as I said with the microphone. Or is it just me hearing that? Okay, if it's fine for you, then it's just me hearing some weird echo. Okay, that's fine. Which is now open um, community uh, here for data on Kubernetes, and there is even some some case to be made. And that's, for example, an article written by the author of uh, Stackless or one of the authors. Why actually Kubernetes is a great platform to run your databases, which might sound a little bit counterintuitive, because at least for me, um, for the more conservative clients, I hear quite often, "Yeah, Kubernetes is cool, but our databases, no, no, nobody touches them; they run on their separate." You know, specialized hardware with our specialized uh, DBA team and, you know, they are, they're holy. Yes, no, actually, it makes a lot of sense to think about running them in Kubernetes because ultimately you will have the same issues to solve that your DBA does, but in Kubernetes with all, all of, you know, this nice functionality that we like, you can do this in a more automated way and in a more, you know, ultimately defined and reliable way. So that's kind of interesting uh, to have a read about that. I'm not going to read this now. What I want to show you is now Stackless, this uh, operator. Stackless is a specialized operator for Postgres, for basically running production grade, uh, grade Postgres on Kubernetes. Now, there are some different operators uh, out there how to run Postgres. And Stackless specifically is specialized on Postgres, only on that. And it's also fair to say that this is the most mature um, Postgres operator out there in terms of features, in terms of for ultimate uh, well, that you can do there because it has been created really with this production greatness in mind. It's not just to say, okay, deploy something quickly, but really the, even the easiest example gives you a lot, of, um, a lot of interesting features. So before I actually show you more slides, I want to dive into the code because you know, that's more fun. For you, more fun to watch. And well, for me, everything can go wrong. So 
what I will show you is because I like coffee. I will show you a coffee shop example with, well, basically three deployments or three, let's say, parts. One is the coffee shop application that is just, well, called coffee shops, uh, powered by Java, but you don't have to care about that. Um, the second one is called Barista, which will be a backend that the first one communicates with. Well, and obviously the third part is a database. So this coffee shop application will use a database there, and we're going to see how to do this. Okay. okay. And I will start right away with just creating actually this stack class operator, because what I have, of course, is a Kubernetes cluster, which one is, uh, which is empty or it's almost empty. That's just to promote you as official Helm child installed. Why? Because it has a nice integration with uh, stack class that we'll show you. And basically what I'm going to do is just to uh, take this from the documentation and say, Helm install my stack class operator which now will take a little bit. So now it will just uh, install all of that. So I don't have to talk to it and hope that it works. Um, and then we will see what we're going to do. We're going to install this operator, which now, as you can see, comes with, uh, will come in its own main space that then runs or the operator itself and then also registers these types. So how it works that we can use custom resource uh, definitions. We can, for example, have a look at some of the reference here in the documentation and say, okay, what do we have here? I will show this, you know, we have some nice uh, documentation here, but I will show it as a code. What we will do in our uh, project in a second is to have a definition for SG is stack class cluster for a cluster. Now, what is a cluster? If uh, you're not familiar with that um, Postgres speak, basically it's like a Postgres instance or a Postgres database in easier terms. It is a Postgres cluster because it will actually come with multiple instances if you instruct it so. So um, as you can see, you know, for the specification, it says, well, at first we have one instance of a, in a specific Postgres version. We can already define here the persistent volumes of the storage there. We will uh, define also then some uh, managed uh, uh, sequels, some scripts. Why? Because that is not part of my application. I could just install it without that, very easy, but then it's empty. And then, you know, that's okay. So it depends how you want to um, do, uh, in, instantiate all of your data. And I have to say my background is as a developer clearly, right? So you see all of that from a developer's perspective and then you, well, you know, you have different choices as a developer. Either you say uh, my app should instantiate and manage this, which in production is, mm. all right. Or you say you have some sort of data migration scripts and one more well-defined approach, such as look for base, flyway, et cetera. Or you say, okay, this is kind of managed or here by typical with the word. I'm very happy to be um, that here would be the equivalent of defining a script. We have multiple ways how to do this. So this is a um, stack with script. This is the easiest one to just have it in line. You can use sweet secrets for creating things like, well, as that's uh, obviously we can use config maps and some other sources. But basically that's going to be it. Now. It's a little bit too big, you see. Congratulations, it installed the stackless operator, so this work. It already gives you some helpful, you know, output is to say, oh, hey, how can I get the, you know, yeah. default uh, running? There's some access because you will get an admin URI uh, for free that, that ships with it. So we'll leave this open and just, uh, we can access it. So now that we will see if I query the head of my path that we now have a stackless namespace where we have, well, an operator that is just one app out here and a REST API that comes with an app UI. And as the name suggests, it comes with the REST API. You can actually use an API to automate stuff there as well. So let's start this now for my project. What I will do, first of all, is I will create this SG cluster. So I will just create a very um, basic and stackless cluster. So let's go through and say, well, Q control apply deployment SG cluster. Um, okay. That's going to create that. I incremented the, or commented out the script. Is it me that and then what I can do, I can deploy already the second one, the barista, because this doesn't have the connection to the database. And now we'll just wait uh, for my application until, uh, until the database is there. So I can already check this other suit that I have uh -huh, already coffee shop DB zero. So that's the part here. My barista part is there as well. So now I wait until 
uh, that happens. So what happens here internally, we will have one problem with abuse of containers because the approach there in Stackverse is to say, I take vanilla Postgres, so just playing Postgres as a lineage, run this as a container, and then there are a few sidecar containers for specific purposes, such as uh, high availability, there's actually an uh, onboard running there as well for metrics and build debrations, and then um, for oh, good reasons. And now it is already up and running. And what I can do in the, in the meantime, just to show you this, I can actually use the port, uh, port for running just for testing purposes here to access the admin UI. I mean, obviously, I could have a proper setup with some, you know, uh, not just port forwarding, but a little balancer or uh, ingress or uh, Istio or gateway, you, you name it, right? Like the typical way how to access something. But here it would be just fine to say, okay, I can access this here. Yes, same style for the certificate, you know, usually you would do this differently, but here for the uh, example, that is okay. And then I can log in. So that is admin per default. And here you, it also shows you the command how to get this. So I can just uh, have this here, this the group as well, or I go to the secret and say, okay, give me this particular secret here, for example, oops, this one I wanted. And then I can say, okay, great. Give me the YAML output for that is there in this username that's admin. And then I will access um, the YAML. You know, that's data clear password, I think. Actually, it makes a lot of sense. There we go. About running in Kubernetes. So, ultimately, you know, the drill, right? Like base 64 decoded and copy to my clipboard. There we have it. And then I can just it here and grab in. And then I will have my cluster already with so this is a little bit small. The cool thing is, is I like this a lot. Has a shoot. When I can use the shoot, it's a lot of And now there is a cluster um, already sure that is already active and I only have one. So it has the primary uh, instance, click on to and so on and so forth. Okay, perfect. Now that's up and running. Let's take the actual application that uses it. It is quite straightforward to just for the deployment. I want to quickly mention two things. This is more of a Azure QC Quarkus. That's the name of the enterprise framework I use. Um, this is more of a configuration thing of those you might say, well, um, this URL is actually the correct one. So it depends how you usually configure in your application as well, obviously the database um, target. I use this application properties. This is now, you don't have to read through all of it. It basically says, well, for a developing mode, I could use obviously something local, right? Like so false drive is in a Docker container. Well, I use what is said that services in this Java today, so it can start up databases for me. But then at the end of the day, I probably want to define uh, this in a production setup, even if the URL is the same, but I need to provide, you know, using password, obviously. So mm -hmm. they, I could obviously uh, put this through in a value, in an environment variable, this integrates nicely with this Quarkus Java application, so I only have to set the environment variable in the world to see if the group, you know, have tons of other forms or you know, really use more, well, the community service binding, whatever. Um, here it references a secret. So, what the database will do once the database is created, this cluster, I have to say, it will create this coffee shop DB, so a bunch uh, of secrets because it has a nice so now this is not the stack list this is my database so that contains the access for my database here so i can just point to it to a super user password which is not the ideal way now for, for the start we do this um that is the postgres super user that has on a full web for everything of course in a um production setup you would change this i will show this in a second that you think we have next time and then we can do this okay enough talking let's now declare it um keep control apply Coffee shot, just the that So how it really you know, the service the gamut in an ingress, and then the deployment should create this part that if everything works correctly, should now well in the beginning it will actually fail. The reason why it fails, it tries to create something relation orders does not exist. So now obviously it tries to query the database already. The data is not there. I did this on purpose now to show you uh, one feature here. Where we can say where is my ID. Now what does that mean? Now I can refer to this knowledge. and this updates here as well. So the way how I can use my database, and this is kind of cool, I can just say that you used to in the Kubernetes space, while you use this declarative approach of updating the YAMLs, 
update your YAML's troop controller fly third against the cluster and you hope that something breaks. And in the same way, um, uh, is this works. So actually I can say, okay, now update and add the script first of all, and then update this cluster. Because so as the cluster, I could just install it without that. And then I hope that now the operator takes care of it. So it works that I did this declarative approach. I don't have to delete it again and create it from scratch. It will actually take these updates and then it will also take care of them in a more like production ready approach. So it will share now see what success has been. Manage scripts, what does it say? Unsuccessfully, so yeah, it has been executed successfully. Perfect. That was just now. So it is there. I can actually check this it's still. Let's try this out. Of course, I could uh, lose my. Um, for it let's say um how could i connect to it well from the outside i don't have access but inside the cluster so i can say there is for that reason a postgres util container that contains stuff like well tutors where i can say if i go to this via dash connect by pc it's local so i don't have to provide a high screen and then i hope that yes my amazon actually has two tables in this um I mean, you, and I should have some base data, you know, like my coffee. So how this works is that it can, you know, in a better coffee shop, I, I was in a very nice coffee shop in this right here before. You can literally throw it to your coffee from right? Like it's a funny way I would like to have to do this from, you know, a field break, code we have for the kind of repose, and that this is uh, depending on the coffee type that we would like to have to go for the code here. So we need some of this data already, we has been created by that script. So that's quite often the case. We obviously can provide these for multiple and services and then what I do um now this should work just to have a clear lot output for you to see I will delete my pod again I really have to do this but then I, I see the actual output and not just you know this bunch of exceptions that I had before so what I was so now of course is a new pod being created and once this up and running I should see just a plain lock here for my application and that's it so that's my job applications and now what I can do hopefully there's one more thing I have to wait for is the ingress that this works from, um, by the way, my cluster that runs on Google Cloud, like uh, G uh, G G G e. um, that provides now the ingress and this address. So let's see if this works. Um, Q health and the health check, no, it And this is the case because it always takes some time to provide these. So I need to wait uh, a little bit more and actually um, check this AMS uh, and other guys on the cloud. Uh, um, so that one that is, um, Develop this will work as well. In the meantime, I can also go inside the cluster, maybe by um, port for whether you know, see if it works. But um, uh, that's just a side note. So this should work there as well. Uh, let's wait a little bit more, and then we have uh, basically the output here. Now this worked, and well, we can see the results. I could already show you the next kind of demo, but I want a, a running application for this. So time. Just a it just takes like four minutes. Okay, maybe it's not the right. Um, otherwise, I will just quickly do a port failure and so for the port that also works, and I can do this locally. I mean, then it's just a problem from uh, Kubernetes Google Cloud, I should say. So, if I do a lo local port failure, then I say I have something like this is now my application, I mean, this has to work. As it uses the Kubernetes way, so that's a health check. Okay, great. great. Uh, and then this Excel health, and then I can log in. Early this slash orders, which are my coffee orders. So the way how I do this, it has an API. It can communicate in that, you know, call it or whatever. Uh, I think it even has some stuff for it. But anyway, to the secret. And, say, okay, and then I can say if I would like to order a new coffee, I just HTTP post something there, a JSON that has the structure and then I can say, okay, type. So I can always send, you know, a special. And then an origin. And if you had a look at the database, this would be validated. So it has to be with valid Colambia uh, country origin for coffee. So Colambia, for example. And then if everything works, it says, okay, great, two or one created. So now that should be in the system. There we go. So let's see this. Okay, perfect. And then with the barista, there is some logic here. So in the beginning, it will have the status and this will be updated. So it will say a status prepared and then status finished. And then after the status correct. So that's not the second delivery that I can test that has complication between. But I'm not interested in, in that. I'm interested in the database. So now this should be in the database. Let's check this out. I have my this total. And there we go. We have these two entries after ID 
status type origin. So this is just my copy or less table. So it's there. Great. Application that you okay. What else I can do because I wanted uh, to show you the stack, some stack risk features. Well, again, first of all, it's very nice that we have the CDs and that also the operator takes care of all of the, you know, sensible handling, like everything that you would expect. The good thing is it is comes built in with this production readiness. So if you say I update something, it just doesn't do it and, you know, it starts running, but it says, okay, it just needs to take the kicker off. And if it's an update that otherwise would uh, have a downtime, it doesn't do it immediately and you have to do a, cluster, a managed cluster restart just to have this in a more sensible approach that it says, oh, I just don't do it right away because it might otherwise, you know, hurt your availability. So the, um, there are some things that we can show you here. So for example, um, instances, I can say I increase the amount of instances. So this is very similar to what you would expect from a deployment app. So I can change the number of instances here. And so, um, that works. Where is my, here. The pilot forms are with the messaging uh, cluster. And then that it would do, it will create more instances. So it's just a secret. Now the scaling map, that's not a big deal. It will just do this. And now that is then actually a separate um, instance and when in the Postgres world this comes with primary and replica and you have heard about this so there will be some Kubernetes services that have been created so the coffee shop to be we've seen this before in the URL that's the service I connect to and this um, is actually a coffee shop to be primary and there's also a replica for the replica instances for now I didn't have a replica part now I will have one let's go back to my cluster here and here that's oh now it's already active now, so I have these two paths, primary and replica, control apply, and DB1 is now a replica there. So now I have two instances, which for now I don't see a difference. So it should still work yeah, because I didn't change anything, right? So I can just connect to my pri primary. It still works with, unless the reason why some evil person would now delete your primary part. Of course, that's a problem because then the primary is gone. But luckily, um, Stackwise implements height availability to show you. So that means you have, um, so if you have multiple instances, you have a, high, a, a highly available cluster. What you can do there is multiple things, for example, for some scheduled maintenance or for some cluster upgrades and changes and whatnot. You can say, okay, I do a, what is called managed switchover. Like the name suggests you can switch over to uh, other parts. Over. Also, if it crashes, you do a failover. That means it, at least you need to go to downtime in order to as well to the different uh, instance there. And we can very easily set this file and update this cluster. You know, deleting the first one, the pet. I just check this one as the primary. And then what happens? Well, now this one will be gone. And here we will see in a second, just to refresh this every few seconds or so, that now there will be a new pending. And now this is already the primary coffee shop DB1. And actually, as we see quite quickly, um, a new response. Yes, this depends also on the um, application, how quickly the application manages its connection pools and, you know, like refreshes them. That's it. That's it. But actually, you see, it's there yeah, again more still, basically, because the, the switch over happens very quickly to the other primary. And now you can see in the overview that now the coffee shop to be running is the primary. And now the second one kind of recovered or it's done in a new part. And now this is the second the new replica. Okay, so this works, I uh, showed quite nicely as well. Now I have two. I um, just showed the higher availability. Let's see if the Google cluster now. Do we have the, the chance to install my IP? Yes. So now IP address here is available, the public one. And now I can do the same thing via the ingress. I can stop this port forwarding. So same story. I have my two um, parts here and I can well, manage my, my coffee there. Uh, so that's basically that. Yeah, there is a production setup. I uh, promised you before, I can also do the script a little bit more sophisticated. Let's see if we have time for it. Or otherwise, I can just show you the script, um, which is how it would usually do. So now, again, from my perspective, I wouldn't show I'm a developer, you know, as long as it works, like whatever. But some DBA would say, no, 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 don't do this with a business user. That's yeah. super user. It has to do, my God, oh, my God, so way to that. Uh, roles and authentic uh, email uh, relations. So what you typically would do ideally is to say, okay, create a database or at least create your own schema and then use a user user 
So to say, create a user, in my case, I call a coffee shop or something like this, and then create either a specific database or at least the tables with a specific owner that you sort of go, this is owned by the owner, and then please connect using that user. Okay, it's very straightforward. First of all, you only have to change your um, your script. There's one cardlet, of course, that is the user with the passport. You wouldn't include this in one of your pitups. So in that, you can also point to a secret um, that can work in different ways. Actually, the easiest one is to just place the SQL literally into a um, secret. So we just have the secret will come through, you know, drop will uh, It exists, create user path shop with password, and then here's some randomly generated password. And then also include this password just to read later or for maybe for the application, something like that. You could change this here. Uh, that would work, and then you can uh, refer that from the script as well. That's why these scripts contain multiple um, their pointers. You can have the script inline, the script from a secret, from a config map, um, things like that. So just it makes sense for this for, for obvious reasons. So that's also possible. Um, I showed you already the scripts that are also uploaded. If I update the scripts, if I update my database, um, the permission will just uh, do this as well. And then uh, that keeps up to date. And I still really will give you some events what happens here. So in case my scripts fail or uh, something like that, um, then it will show me here and I will see okay, what, ha what happened here. So that's um, quite interesting there as well. Okay. There are some more features um, that we can have a look at. I will just go through the list uh, here that I took from the website. So basically what I also quite like, um, you get this vanilla Postgres. So you have like, there's not no, much magic. You get the full control to get the Postgres user to do whatever uh, you like, basically. Um, in the beginning, I didn't care much about that, but I went more into it, which is the second one, which is true at default. Again, I came from a developer background, so I was like, well, I don't care. But actually you should, because on a production setup, it does make a difference, especially with how many connections do you have. It might say, well, you do a connection, but if it's only on the application side and you have like 10 instances, then, you know, there's no for that. So we might, um, need to, to take uh, that. Um, into consideration as well. So there is a um, server side connection pooler built into one of these containers, which it binds to the link. So that's um, the high availability we've seen, and CAD and Git uh, GitOps ready is just pretty clear cool because we can parse out of that stuff in the YAMLs and then you know, put it into GitOps. Although it also supports this extra API. So if you um, want to do uh, this uh, REST API, you know, after that out. Uh, manage backups. So I uh, found a lot of interest in backups uh, so, uh, there. So you can just, you know, define them also in a managed way. There is this, uh, it's uh, all COD just for the backups here uh, that you can define and that goes to, um, there is one called backups and object storage that then points to the actual storage. So we, which you can point to an S3 goblet and I think some other film we yeah, can do that as well. Uh, that then, um, the backup. In where it is located, it. but that's uh, fully managed. Sure, um, we have it down. The the red comes over if you're more a UI person. I know more uh, command line person, but you know you see some, I don't know, dark or light more than some uh, <laughs> kind of uh, pictures there. Um, the web console is also fully featured, so everything you can do with the um, the yellows you can do in the web console. Ah, observability. I wanted to show you. I can say it. Um, let's create a few more coffees there just to get some. Uh, not the actual host, never still uh, one second, let's do this again. Post some type espresso, um, just for you to see a little bit more traffic so that we can origin Colombia. Can you see something here? Okay, perfect. So let's do this in a while loop because why not? And then we say we're creating a new coffee, create a new coffee, so I let the coffee real, real, real bit there, uh, just to see a little bit of, uh, of traffic and derivatives, uh, obviously. So the reason why I included this beneath to us, here it is, um, is just that then you have a monitoring available. Um, this is big enough. So it includes a Grafana board, but you can also, uh, that, that's the Grafana board, the Helm Chat Grafana board, you can also connect to it directly. And then I will show you, this is also a Grafana. I know I can read the single scenario. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's just too big here. Well, I don't really get the point. It has some stats out now that I'm writing. Slowly, so it has to the time range of 90. It still works. I'm okay. So something like this. 
and then we see what is something that is going on. And um, this works because nowadays, and I think the uh, creators of uh, Stack Wars were involved uh, with this, there is a, is a Plotner filter, I think is the name, an Envoy filter for Postgres. Uh, there in the and this is also contained in one of the containers. Actually, this is all embedded uh, by, uh, um, well, by the Envoy and then via the metrics. So it includes, you know, integrates there in your typical uh, class, um, cluster Kubernetes landscape. Here. So you can have this and, you know, get all sorts of whatever transactions are that you're interested in here. So all sorts of technical metrics out of the box if you do the integration with the monitoring. Uh, like I did it. So that's just, you know, very helpful. And then of course you can define your own things from an application perspective. I don't know. I'm typically more interested in either, um, technical metrics like these or than business metrics, like, you know, number of coffee creators or something like this. Um, then both are interesting. Then I typically on the database side would just use this and on your application side, it would also include some to be used the the generic whatever metrics, but it's very helpful that this is just there, especially out of the box quickly. Um, look through it. Well, we have few of the future web console. Oh, there's one cool feature that has some animation. So, um, we have some database operations, and this is actually there's even a COD. Again, I'm not a database expert, um, but there are some, um, so this, this, I think that's, oh, yeah, that's the old, uh, cluster. Oh, this is the second the new web. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's that's I dropped the iron. Okay. No, now I have to. Can I copy this? And I just want to remove this. It doesn't uh, come out in the list. Yes. Right. Um, what you can do is to have some DB ops like operations that the name suggests. And then you can read through, you know, the documentation, what the remain of it is. Uh, basically, like different uh, types. For some sort of planned cluster room start and some other sort of, well, my friend's called back views and then things like that, room start. That is kind of funny, and that's the reason why I included the different minor version. You can do actually a um, time work run here. At, you can do an, a database version upgrade, like a Postgres version update. And especially if you do a minor version I upgrade, this works without um, having too much impact. Thanks. So, where is it? A uh, minor version upgrade. This is so you see where it's available here. Style and things like that. But then, if you plan, it's not just having style, it's basically so it's the way to do this either in place to reduce impact, which uses then multiple parts. So, it tries to do a little bit of a rolling up with approach here. And so, like now I have a new version that's about 15.0, and it's supposed to be 0.1. So, it's a perfect way to operation. And then it does this. And even so, um, animation here, I think once it's started, it does there's one card red, of course. That is the yeah, it's running. And then there's some, you know, cool stuff here that is happening in the <laughs> background. So that's, you know. And here is this, uh, the connection and things like that. So I can uh, have this, yeah, because that's still running. So we see the impact may be here. And then I have the paths running in the background. Now I have, of course, more of that. But then because, yeah, I have two wanted instances. So I have three or at at one time. You will see also there's a part that does uh, this upgrade and then, you know, manages these things. So it's just true, you know, that there is some sort of animation going on here. And well, basically what is really helpful is that there is a well-defined operation for it. It's not just a heavy delete, um, create user, but uh, this has been taken care of and this is implement, uh, implemented by the operator. So then afterwards, you've seen my, um, COD that uh, says still 15.0 and then the status will be 15.1. Um, all of that Kubernetes stuff, like usually how you would interact with Kubernetes resources. If I query my cluster, I can also say, you know, uh, get uh, G clusters, right? And then I can say, okay, perfect. Now you're always describe the clusters, all of that stuff, you know, as we would expect it works as well. And they populate a lot of tools here. So you can get the status, you can get the status of fewer, okay, like have the studio ops, upgrade, action, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, you can read all sorts of stuff to give you there. The nice thing is it integrates in the Kubernetes world, so you don't have to have any extra tool, which is, you know, use a tube control or a clear minus or whatever you I would like to have. Uh, connection thing I mentioned, I have the ability to show distributed logs with another feature you can uh, create. It's actually using another Postgres cluster internally, where then all of the um, where Postgres logs will disappear and then you can create them via a SQL, but again, I'm developer person, I don't care about Postgres logs. So that's that. 
And Postgres extensions. Have you ever used Postgres extensions? I, okay, you do it. I, I, I saw it. That's a big thing. I personally I mean, didn't use them that much. Um, they support a lot of extensions out of the box. So it's more than 150. So that you can also define in the CODs that like there's a few extension for uh, in the cluster. And then they just come automatically. They're integrated. There's a mechanism under the hood. And then you can use this. And that is not on the list. So the thing to repeat is sharding. I think uh, Stackers they one of five will include the same right now that's Peter. Uh, will include sharding via Cyclus is a, is a uh, technology there. It definitely can set up ML and clusters and um, manage this as well. Actually manage as a CMD, the maybe new CMD, show the cluster or something, then you can um, build this up there. Okay, I think on a demo perspective, I'm happy that everything works. So uh, my was stable enough and everything in my cluster uh, was kind of cool. Um, yes, so these are just, I mean, we we'll see it's still running here, and I have all the in my cluster, and if it's still open, yes, I, it. um, I think I closed it somewhere. Then I can just, you know, connect to this again, exec, and then see uh, what is there, and then now it probably should have the meta forwarders, I guess. The console has a full feature, so everything you can do with that database, yes, and then it will, then it will have an exception in that, because, exactly. And perfect. So I think these were with the points uh, I had. Um, I have the stuff uh, online on my GitHub, which includes most of it is Java. So it mm -hmm. you know, includes the, uh, the CODs for you to try out and just installate. I think you basically need a, a Kubernetes cluster and then you're good to go. You can check out the documentation, stackless.mail. And yeah, if you want to follow me on social media, I mostly do um, either Java related things or developer productivity related things, sometimes cloud native and container parts, but you know, the ratio is mostly actually on the enterprise space. Um, because I'm uh, uh, out there. So, the do you have any questions? One question um, Do you know if they plan add support for auto scaling? That's quite that you're out of this space and you can a similar way as you upgrading and enlarge the disks for database. That's a good question. I think they already have this. It could be, I don't know if they have a feel for it, but I, I, I don't know out of the box, but it should be because it shouldn't be a big deal, right? Because the uh, scaling is already there in, in theory. Um, in the worst case, you can have another mechanism um, on top of it, but uh, sort of controller that checks your metrics. That's what I would suspect and then use it from this perspective. Yeah, that's what it is. Another question? So I have a question. How many databases you have in versions and what are the services? Uh, very good question. So you would need to ask this to people on the uh, Stackers. So the Stackers community, there is a Slack channel. And um, most of them is, is managed by Ingress to the, uh, the company behind it. Ask them because they have commercial support and I'm pretty sure they have way bigger databases than I do. <laughs> what I usually have, it depends on the project. So uh, I actually don't have any the numbers of sizes. The biggest one is a few firm entries per tail. That's not really big. But you know, that's me usually in enterprise uh, um, software. So, Mostly from what I see, the issues are not related to size, but um, related to manageability. It's to say who takes care of all of the automated backups, the upgrades, what happens about, you know, uh, downtimes and things like that. That's usually the things I we struggle with in my project. And if size is an issue, of course, then it's, then it's a question. Uh, but I think to answer your question, uh, generally, it's it's just a post question there because they run it includes vanilla process and then whatever are your limitations there we know in terms of what you will is that once you run into the limits you will start sharding or think about something like this right especially with the relation database that's what i assume but i'm pretty sure if you join the slack channel you ask if these folks they can give you cool numbers yeah. you better just turn it oh, no. i don't can now copy this i just want to if this thing i'm not sure if i missed this but what's what's used for the clustering um I, I guess you might choose the titles for sharding. It's for sharding. Um, Petrology is used for high availability. Yes, I use. Okay. And some other sort of benchmark, bed shield, and things like that. It's kind of funny. And the documentation explains as well. They have to have a list of stacks. Hey, I guess you went to a couple of other operators in your history, probably. 
So, just out of curiosity, did you check the cloud native PG or Salander operator? And by the end, you end up with this. This looks great. I mean, just at least you have some some um, bad experiences with these RS. Not necessarily bad. A very good question. I looked at this Salander one. I wouldn't just. And you remember the whole group of the river. Naturally, in bad experience, the only like, problem is that if some uh, features are not supported, so then you're just on your own. I mean, the rest guys is a pill there, then you have to do it yourself or one in the end of the oil. So we're the somebody else is saying, um, and you need to take care of it yourself. So that's basically the issues with the operator. Stress. So from my perspective, none of them is really bad. And it's just like limited so that you're saying so because the easiest operator is for me to fire up a state for a second and you know, so I hear it, it's a start connection and then you're on your phone and, 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 and so, you know, do all of this and then you start. Um, as far as I'm concerned, a stack versus the most like, you know, future rich or I have the most and so they have features there. Other than that, I would just say see it from support if your project needs commercial because even if you like most of support, you know what my clients need it. Yes, yes. Uh read what their requirements are and yeah. especially from the production game as features like how critical it is to see to do the thing this presentation but uh, do you have some recommendation for Sandra operators to work you know no I Never yeah, use because I'm the new in my project. And actually, now uh, most of my projects are quite straightforward before reaching the level base. Yeah, it's non relation that there was their own issues. So that is the server for different topic for different And gets uh, as G clusters, right? And then I can say, it. any other questions? You may not at least. It's all if you ever would expect the words as well. And the practical is those will be like see. Um for so for me personally, again, like for most of my uh, clients, actually most of them now run on the same sort of cloud. Yeah. So I'm from Germany and German uh, let's say German companies are more conservative usually. And especially if you if you're having a conservative space like a fresh or insurance or something like that, I don't know the conservative. And even I have the ability all of the most of that run in a cloud setting like AWS as a Google Fed thing that on this kind of interesting internally. Yeah. Yeah. And Yes, uh, some of them on on premise. I would say it uh, depends. It basically just depends what you want to uh, connect to or what you want to be the pain. And if it's if it's Kubernetes, okay, then it's you know, pretty good because it's, in theory you can uh, change the quite quite easily. Now actually, I have a few clients who specifically want that that they say we're trying to be at least in theory for the cloud that you don't want to do a specific cloud provider in that case and just do that to the medics and if we need anything it will lose that operator and then ever so um that is one thing just to the metal staff uh, we're not and then people who are behind them so when it is some it be just plain automatic with clean the container red without it uh with other things on the operator the more a similar product that we are in most is just some cloud those uh solution just with presence you were immediately in those case just to cloud so that will be um at the night and stairs something else because it's just faster uh, for me um, um yeah the I mean, really need personal my projects but yeah I'm that's gonna that was unhappy with everything but so uh, so i thought it was stable enough and everything in my trust okay any other is there something on the uh, slide or i don't know if the so, question all right i'll um, that i will do a few minutes here if you have some more questions and yeah thank you again very much for your attention and